Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 14th. Today, our special guest is Dr. Pooja Argawal, and her topic is Science of Learning, Transform Teaching with Strategies from Cognitive Science. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm now going to turn the mic over to Susie Higley, who will introduce Pooja and ask her the newbie question. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. I first had the pleasure of learning from Dr. Agarwal during Matt Miller's Ditch Summit over Christmas vacation. And she brought forward things about the brain and learning that I had never encountered before. And I just, I had to learn more from her. And I have since signed up for her weekly emails, and there are wonderful things on her website as well. So I'm so pleased that she's able to be with us. She is an expert in the field of cognitive science, has conducted learning and memory research in a variety of classroom settings for more than 10 years. She's passionate about evidence-based education. She has extensive teaching experience in K-12 through and higher education, as well as expertise in educational policy. Currently, she's an assistant professor at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, teaching psychological science to exceptional undergraduate musicians. She leads RetrievalPractice.org, a hub, hub of cognitive science research, resources, and tips for educators. She's been supported by grants from the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Education. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Education Week, Scientific American, as well as academic journals, books, and podcasts. You'll definitely want to look at her website, follow her on Twitter. And we will go to the newbie question. What is the difference between short and long-term memory, and is it important for teachers to understand to improve their teaching strategies? So we will turn it over to you to answer this and on to the presentation. Hi, well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for having me. This is Pooja, uh, and thanks, of course, to Lori, Peggy, Susie, Tammy, and Paula uh, for putting this all together. I'm so excited to be here and share this really neat research with everyone. Uh, and so to jump right in with the newbie question, what is the difference between short and long-term memory? And is it important for teachers to understand uh, to improve their teaching strategies? And I love this question. Um, and one thing I think about when it comes to short-term and long-term memory is that I think we all have a sense of what it what they are and what the difference is. So being able to remember someone's name at a party could be an example of short-term memory, and long-term memory could be thinking back to our uh, 16th birthday. <laughs> and in terms of the importance for teachers, of course, as teachers and, and my background in K-12 and teaching at the college level now, we all want to facilitate our students' long-term memory. Uh, I, I feel strongly that that's a key component of, of education. Uh, and we make this, we have this understanding that Students may remember something in the short term, you know, during a class or reading a chapter, uh, and then that translates to the long term. And a component of what we'll talk about is that's not always the case. So just because students remember things in the short term does not mean it sort of gets into long-term memory. And so I'm excited that we can talk about how to make that connection and, and really bridge between short-term and long-term memory. Um, so uh, everyone can hear me, right? I hope so. Yes, great. Uh, so we'll move on. Um, and I'm loving all the chat. I'll try to, to keep an eye on everything. Uh, so again, my name is Pooja, and I'd encourage you to visit my website. A lot of the research I'll be talking about is on retrievalpractice.org. That first poll question, do you or have you ever um, Part of the phrase retrieval practice. 
So we'll be talking about that research. My own website is PoojaAgarwal.com. If you would like to learn more about me, um, I have a number of research publications, information about the professional development. I typically offer that sort of thing. And of course, I'm on Twitter as well. So I like to jump straight in with a question. And if you uh, were there with the Matt Miller Ditch That Textbook, or I recently was on a podcast with Jennifer Gonzalez, The Cult of Pedagogy, I like to ask us to think about, uh, and, and I encourage you to type this into the chat, what did you have for breakfast this morning? We'll take a minute and type into the chat, what did you have for breakfast? So uh, my students, when I, I like to ask this to my college students, and, and um, when I speak with teachers or anyone really, and it's a fun mix between things like uh, French toast. Uh, I appreciate Maureen who had Diet Coke. <laughs> I typically have coffee only. Uh, and then it, it always surprises me. People who have these wonderful breakfasts they make every morning, like um, I think Jennifer Gonzalez had spinach on an English muffin with about three other side dishes. and. Uh, it all just sounds so wonderful. So um, here's another question I like to ask. Uh, again, we'll take just a moment in the chat to share your favorite vacation or road trip. Where did you go? Great, I love Glacier National Park, Peggy. <laughs> um, so here's one more. Does anyone know, take a guess in the chat, uh, what year the lawnmower was invented? And what year was the lawnmower invented? Uh, manual, yeah, the original lawnmower. <laughs> BC. <laughs> so um, if you look on Wikipedia at least, oh, a goat is a good one. Um, the uh, original lawnmower was invented in 1830. And the reason I like to ask all these questions about breakfast and our, our favorite vacations and about little facts like lawnmowers or presidents is because I like for us to, to be mindful that we do all of this learning and we remember things every day. So we probably didn't really think about our breakfast when we joined the webinar until I asked, but it's something we do and can think about and can sort of mentally go back and think about what we had for breakfast. And mentally go back and think about our favorite vacations. Uh, but something that happens with our students is that they feel so anxious, right, when we ask about things. And I wonder, my guess is, tell us in the chat, when I asked about what you had for breakfast or your favorite vacation, there was a feeling for that very different from asking about the year in which a lawnmower was invented. Right? And sometimes that's the feeling students have with a pencil in their mouth. Oh gosh, I can't remember or I can't get this to, to stick in my head. And there are a, a very basic model of memory here is a three-part model where we can think about memory and learning as encoding. We try to get things 
into our heads. And what we call storage, we try to get it to stick around and store in our heads. And then we assess learning. In the classroom, as teachers, we want to see did stuff encode, did students encode and remember things, and did it stick around so that by the time we assess it, um, we can tell how much students have learned. And that's sort of a basic process and approach in the classroom. And one thing I also like to think about is with this idea of encoding, we're getting information into students' heads. So we're lecturing with students, we're having them read textbooks, we're focused on getting that information in. And what I find fascinating about this area of research in cognitive science is that learning can be so much more effective when we focus on getting information out of our heads. So what I'd like to talk about briefly today um, is the foundation of what we call retrieval practice in cognitive science, so we'll break that down a little bit. Some quick power-ups uh, to retrieval, so how to make it even more effective in our classrooms. Some teaching strategies and then thoughts and reflection time on what we can do next after learning about um, this research today in the webinar. So uh, I'd like to take just a second to acknowledge uh, a lot of the leaders in cognitive science who do this work. And so I've been fortunate to spend uh, more than 10 years working with my PhD advisor, Roddy Rodiger, uh, or Henry Rodiger. He's one of the authors of uh, the popular book, Make It Stick, and also with Mark McDaniel, another author for Make It Stick. And then these are researchers from all over the uh, world who have had a lot of support and there's been a recent boom of research uh, in this area. And so they, of course, you can access more of their research on uh, my website, retrievalpractice.org, and check out more about what they're doing. So in terms of retrieval practice, what I mean by this is to retrieve, almost like a golden retriever, to go out and get something and pull it back into your head. And there are lots of different ways people can define this. Uh, it can be a fun exercise to ask students, what is that feeling when you think back to your favorite vacation? Uh, what is that feeling when you think about a random trivia fact? And what's really exciting with this research is, especially again with this recent boom, it's shown that simply pulling information out, and we'll talk about some ways to do that, pulling information out improves this transfer of learning. So not just memorization, but really thinking more complexly. But it also improves that connection, as I mentioned, between short-term and long-term memory. So we might think students are remembering stuff, but as we all know, you know, next month, next year, students have that deer in headlights. Uh, <laughs> do we talk about this? I can't remember it. And so retrieval really benefits that connection between short and long-term memory. And also, there's lots of research with all ages, everything from uh, kindergarten students on up to older adults uh, and different content areas, that that process of getting information out makes that learning more sticky. So a very basic research example uh, is a study you may have heard of by Rodiger and Karpicki. So Roddy Rodiger again from that top left of the research slide. And what they did uh, in 2006 is they had college students read uh, sort of brief Wikipedia articles about sea otters. <laughs> and then they asked college students to reread those passages over and over again. Or they had students read the sea otter passage once, and then write down everything they could remember. And so they kind of do this a bunch of times. Students would either reread passages over and over, or they'd read it and then just write down what they could remember. And what they found was that after five minutes, um, of course, students, when they reread these passages, they remember pretty well. They could write down about 83% of the key facts from the passages. And if they had read the passage only once and then done this writing exercise, for that condition, students only remembered 71% of the key concepts. And again, this is after five minutes, right? So you reread something over and over. Of course, it makes sense we remember more. 
But after a week, you see this huge drop off. Can you see a situation now where students who had, uh, when students had reread passages, they've forgotten more than half? So again, that connection between short term memory and long term memory, there's a huge amount of forgetting if you reread passages. But if students simply read the passage and wrote down what they could remember the first time they read it, they actually remember and retain, they stored a lot more of that information. And it's only after one week. And we'll keep seeing this, this um, situation again and again where what we remember in the short term is not what we necessarily remember in the long term. And this is an illusion that students have as well. That when we ask students, predict your learning on a scale of 0 to 7, how much of this passage on sea otters are you going to remember? And overwhelmingly, students say they will remember more if they had reread the passage than if they had read it and taken a brief quiz. So students also tend to think, how I do now is how I'm going to do later. But a great quote I love from this book, Make It Stick, is that learning that's easy is like writing in sand. It's here today and gone tomorrow. So just because it's here and we can remember stuff doesn't mean it's going to be around. So one thing I like to focus on, and I know I'm going through it fast, so yes, please include your questions in the chat. Um, I, again, have a background in K-12. That was my passion. That's how I started my career was as an elementary school teacher. And I'm really excited, interested, passionate about seeing if this laboratory research works in real classrooms. And so we spent more than 10 years doing research in a school district outside of St. Louis. And with these simple retrieval techniques, we were able to raise student grades from a C to an A. So um, in one example of our study, we simply in, uh, included three low stakes quizzes. In this situation, it was, um, uh, sorry, seventh grade anatomy. And in seventh grade anatomy, students got brief clicker quizzes. And in this graph, I know it's a lot, there you can see the condition, what I call retrieval practice, where students got three quizzes versus the teacher's regular lessons, when students didn't get any clicker quizzes, but the teacher continued to go through the typical lessons. At the very end of the chapter, so just a few days after the, the chapter lesson, students remembered a lot more when they engaged in three brief clicker quizzes compared to regular lessons without. And you can see by the end of the semester and the end of the year, that red bar is always statistically significantly higher. So when students just engage in those three quizzes, they remember much more even nine months later. And I love this because we don't tend to do research like this in laboratories. We can't get college students to come back <laughs> at the end of the academic year. So it's pretty exciting that we can show that with K-12 students. In that 10 years of research, we've done a whole lot of follow-ups, and uh, we can't, I, we don't have time to go through it all. Of course, I have more um, downloadable publications on my website for these on poojaagarwal.com. But I've looked at everything from short answer versus multiple choice quizzes, open book quizzes, students uh, going online and doing things like Quizlet. Uh, and they all, in general, all of that retrieval practice improves learning. And again, just getting that information out can feel a little challenging. So sort of like we may have had a, uh-oh, I don't know what year lawnmowers were <laughs> invented. But it's that challenge, or what we call in the literature, desirable difficulty. It's desirable. We want students to be challenged when they're retrieving and thinking about what they've learned. So here are some strategies, and I love seeing this conversation in the chat uh, with Rick and Peggy. One thing uh, I love to do that I mentioned in the Ditch That Summit, um, Ditch That Textbook Digital Summit and on Cult of Pedagogy is what we call free recall. There are lots of names. Uh, I've discussed them in some email updates I send out as part of retrievalpractice.org is a brain dump. So simply write down everything you can remember 
about what we just learned um, on ancient Egypt. Write down everything you can remember about what you just learned um, from the current lesson. And you can modify this to just say, what are two things you remember? What's the takeaway you might have? Could all serve as great exit tickets. Uh, and I see that there's a, a helpful conversation with Rick. And so, Rick, I hope you can share some examples of the exit tickets you use. Some other ways I like to um, see retrieval in action, weekly retrieval. So I do quizzes myself um, in my classes. I've got uh, a link that we can share. I'm not sure I have it. So Peggy, maybe you can remind me to share a link for a blog about how I use retrieval in my classroom. I recently sent an email update out about think per share, but how to make sure students are retrieving. They're not just sort of slacking off or getting by without actually retrieving. And then there are lots of technology, uh, tech tools, apps that work really well for retrieval. I am currently in love with Flipgrid. Uh, it's a video interface you can use so students can sort of retrieve and have a discussion with each other. Some guidelines that are really important. Again, retrieval is super simple. I do think uh, we all use it as teachers from that poll we had. The majority of us already use quizzes in class. It's important to keep this low or no stakes. So when retrieval is high stakes, that's when we get into this feeling of assessment. And that's when students don't feel comfortable retrieving. Oh my god, this is a task. This is an exam. I am so scared. But what's great is not only that retrieval improves learning, but if we take away that stakes, then students are more likely to engage in the in-class and also outside of class as a study strategy. So really keeping it less than one minute or lower no stakes helps students become engaged and understand that those challenges are good. So as teachers, uh, and this was also in the poll, is how do you review and help students learn information? I think it's great to think about not just saying to students, here's what we did last week, but instead to take that same amount of time and just ask students, what did we do last week? And give them the opportunity to share. I'll pause just a minute for questions about retrieval. I did capture a few. I don't know if you want them now or at the Q&A. Um, both would be fine. I'm happy to continue or uh, wait. And there okay. is a link I just put in the chat about how I use retrieval practice in my classroom. OK. Um, OK, we can save till the Q&A. Yeah, let's, let's wait. OK. Um, so to continue, especially to those who just joined us, welcome. Uh, anyone remember in what year the first lawnmower was invented? Yeah. It <laughs> Cheating, no cheating. See, this is where the low or no stakes comes in. This is just for fun, and it was 1830. So Paula, Scott, Maureen, John, great job. Uh, and Patty, you typed it in wrong. So it was 1830, and this is a good example of the first power-up I want to um, mention real quick is called spacing. Again, I think we do this all the time as teachers, but it's something to be mindful of, is to space retrieval over time. So instead of just assuming, oh, well, it's a one and done, students got it, let's move on, spacing is really important. And again, there's lots of research to demonstrate that it improves learning. So one example uh, I like to provide, this was a study where students were given um, math problems, they were permutation problems, and so they had to, you know, come up with different combinations of letters. 
uh, and this was with college students. And the college students either got 10 of these permutation problems uh, in one week, just 10 questions in one week, or they could answer those practice problems, five problems in week one, and then five problems in week two. So a super simple study, which is more effective? Should students do 10 problems in one week, or 10 problems but spaced across two weeks? And as you can imagine, after one week, students do better if they cram, if they simply did those 10 pages all at once, uh, sorry, 10 problems all at once, but again, you see this really interesting drop off, that connection or the lack of connection between short term and long term memory. After four weeks, when students did five math problems in week one, five math problems in week two, they're much better able to complete new math problems just by spacing it out. Uh, one question I frequently get is how much should I space out? Uh, my content in my classroom. And so one study we did in the K-12 schools outside of St. Louis was we played around with all the different quizzes, the clicker quizzes we were giving. So we either, again, had teachers in the regular lessons, um, or we gave students clicker quizzes before a lesson, a pre-quiz, a post-quiz right after the teacher's lesson, and then a review quiz, so a few days after the teacher's lesson. And exam performance at the end of the chapter, just a few days later, increased the further the quizzes were from the teacher's initial lesson. So if clickers were a few days after the lesson, students did much better on the final chapter exam than if the clickers were before or right after. And we see the exact same uh, pattern at the end of the semester. So in other words, the more that we space out those quizzes, the better. But some of the guidelines I like to give is that it can be super quick. Uh, I don't think that focusing on how much spacing is the critical component of spacing. I think what's key is that we do it in the first place and the more the better. One thing to note is what I call a hybrid approach where it may be for some students or a lot of these students, there's research showing that we may not want to start spacing immediately. Again, that desirable difficulty. We may want to start with going over material every day, but then spacing it out. And a component is, is also of spacing it out is not just to ask students what they learn today. You know, we sometimes have our own children and we say, hey, what did you learn at school today? A really key thing to keep in mind is to ask students, what did you learn yesterday? What did you learn last week? And that spacing is really being mindful of this power up. So coming back to what students covered and what they retrieved. So really space that out over time. So that's the first power up. The second one is what we call interleaving. And this one, I just finished a two-part email update. So I'm sure Peggy can send those links um, about interleaving. But it's sort of about mixing up content. But what's really important is that that content be similar. It has to be related content. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, one story, an example I like, we don't have time to go to research, so I'll tell you a quick story, is that because I teach at the Berkeley College of Music outside of Boston, uh, I teach psychology and cognitive science and neuroscience. I'm not a musician, but I had um, a student come to me. She was just kind of hanging out at office hours, and she said, gee, you know, I really cannot remember this song. I have to remember the song. She's a music therapy student, and she was going to a practicum soon. And so I asked her about the song. It was called On the Sunny Side of the Street, which is a jazz standard from the 50s. And I said, all right, instead of going start to finish, start to finish with the song, um, let's go through and mix it up. So why don't you sing the third verse? Great, now sing the fifth verse, now sing the second one, now sing the chorus, and we just kind of skip around. 
And within 10 minutes, she was able to learn the song. And it's important to mix that around so that we can really understand the difference between similar topics. We're not just going start to finish. We're not just going through a set of addition problems and then a set of subtraction problems. Students have to look at something and really know, gee, is this a subtraction problem or is this an addition problem? You can't just plug and chug by going from the start to the end of the song. So one uh, great example I liked uh, during the recent email update was fruit salad. So it's great to mix things up and make students discriminate. Uh, and with fruit salad, we want them to do that with similar topics. So we wouldn't take a vegetable, we wouldn't take broccoli and put it into our fruit salad. I think that would be pretty gross, right? We want students to compare and contrast similar things. And so interleaving is really about mixing up, ooh, mixing up similar things um, and really encouraging students to choose what they need to know. So students just have a block of addition questions. <laughs> Peggy said she hasn't heard of the phrase plug and chug. Students can just plug and chug. They know this is all addition. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm not even going to read the word problem. I just know I have to add the two numbers. And with, with discrimination, with interleaving, it's important to get away from that. And again, this is a power-up with retrieval. So retrieval is great, but let's make sure we're mixing it up. We're not just retrieving the same problems, the same song over and over. And the third power-up is what we call feedback. Again, it's something that's totally intuitive that we use as teachers, but there, are, uh, there is a lot of research on how we can do this more effectively and why it's so important. So take a second in the chat, what is the capital of Australia? Write down in the chat, what's the capital of Australia? Yes, yeah, so the capital of Australia is Canberra. Good job to Susie and Patty and Maureen. <laughs> uh, yes, it's totally surprising, right? A lot of us, especially I think of the United States, think that the capital is Sydney. And this is where feedback is really important. Students will think they know something. You know, we're sure that it's Sydney. Sydney sounds right. But then students are surprised that they bomb an exam. They don't do well. But I studied and I knew it, right? And this is what we call metacognition, is when students think they know something, but they don't actually know it. And there's lots of great research. You can download some resources um, from this one on retrievalpractice.org by John Donlowski. And the reason these study strategies, like reading a textbook over and over again, is ineffective is because of what we call an illusion of fluency or an illusion of confidence. Students think they can see. They think they have 20-20 vision, but it turns out that they didn't get feedback and they didn't test their own knowledge. They haven't retrieved. And so when students have this, oh, gee, you know, I, I um, studied for hours and I didn't get it, well, it's because they use strategies like this and they were never given any feedback and there was no opportunity for feedback. So with retrieval, again, students can, can really see what I know and what I don't know and then feedback can help fix sort of incorrect information. Um, it's what we call the hypercorrection effect, especially with the Australia example. My guess, my hope, is that now going forward, many of us will remember that Canberra is the capital of Australia because it's just so shocking and surprising, right? Uh, another thing that um, is effective for student learning is to have them predict their own learning. Then when students get feedback, they realize, oh, wow, I was totally off base. 
I didn't actually know this as well as I thought that I did. So, um, yeah, what students tend to do is students tend to, to kind of evaluate their own learning and say, oh, yeah, I, I think I know it. But retrieval really helps students see, did I really know it or did I not? And all of these things, retrieval, the power-ups, they all go into this idea of desirable difficulties or challenging learning. When we can think about, we retrieve, we space it out, we mix it up, and we get feedback, that's all super powerful for learning. And again, there's tons of research on this that I would love to share. It's all on my website, uh, and I'm happy to go into it more during the Q&A. Does anyone like pub trivia? Yes or no in the chat real quick. Do you like pub trivia? So Peggy definitely loved pub trivia. <laughs> and what's fun about pub trivia is people go to bars, you know, they get together with friends, uh, and they love facts, right? My father-in-law loves trivia. And he loves being able to talk about what he knows, getting stumped, having fun, challenging questions. But when students walk into classrooms, suddenly our students are uncomfortable with retrieval. And it's because we associate that retrieval with assessment. I only get information out of my head when I'm taking an exam, when it's a standardized test. And so there's this, this need for us to flip retrieval from a negative to a positive. You know, students think about retrieval being this bad, graded, nerve-wracking thing, but if we want them to use retrieval in the classroom and when they study, we need to get away from those high stakes. And so one thing we did, again, after or over almost 10 years of research, so again, more than 1,000 K-12 students, students, when they were in our research where we gave them quick, quick, quicker quizzes uh, or paper and pencil quizzes, we asked students at the end of the school year, does all this retrieval practice make you more or less nervous? And 72% of students said that this retrieval makes them less nervous for tests. We didn't ask them why, but of course it might be that students, uh, you know, have a better sense of what they know and what they don't know. Um, students are learning from the retrieval, and so they become less anxious. So I think what we can do as teachers is not just to include more retrieval. We already do that, I think, in many ways but how to help students change or switch that mindset, flip from a negative to a positive, is to be really supportive, to make sure the retrieval in our classes are no stakes or low stakes. So they're not attached to grades. They're sort of a, um, a game I'm seeing, um, just, like, just like English pubs, uh, trivia games. This is where Kahoot comes in, Flipgrid, asking students, just write down what you know and then moving on with your lesson. That's all challenging, and that challenge is a good thing. And one thing to note with students is that with challenges, how students do with retrieval, remember on that research I showed, they may not do very well now, but they're going to remember a lot more over the long term. Some other things we can do as teachers is to start small. It doesn't have to be revamping our courses to get away from lectures and to move toward retrieval. We can do small, simple things, again, like asking students, kick out a piece of paper, write down two things you remember from yesterday, and then we move on. Exit tickets, entry tickets um, can really make a difference in flipping from a negative to a positive, making it small and simple, and um, what I like to point out is that uh, we can save time in the long run with retrieval. There's lots of research on this. It's not that retrieval has to take more time. 
it may mean that we can teach a little less content. So we might be able to teach 100 concepts versus 90 if we give these short quizzes. But research demonstrates students remember a lot more. So even if we've taught fewer concepts, students are much more likely to remember more of what we've taught. So is it important for us to teach those concepts in the short term or to help students remember things in the long term? And I think that's why retrieval is really critical, is it helps get us to the long term and it doesn't have to take more time. So of all these strategies, we've talked about retrieval, spacing, interleaving, feedback. Write down or put in the chat which of those strategies can you use tomorrow in your classrooms, in your library, in your school. Which one can you use tomorrow? And elaborate a little bit how you can use it tomorrow or Monday. I know some people are typing. Um, I do hope that you're being mindful. This is retrieval, right? Uh, how you can use feedback, spacing, interleaving, how you can do this in your classroom tomorrow or Monday. It doesn't, again, have to be this big thing. And in terms of what's also next, because I know we're getting short on time, I'd just like to provide a few resources. So again, my um, website is retrievalpractice.org. I provide uh, cognitive science research. You can download journal articles. You can get links to many of the researchers that I had, or to all of the researchers that I showed at the beginning. Um, I have weekly email updates. Uh, I know, I think Susie uh, or Rick said that they're their favorite email all week that they get. Uh, I have links to other books, websites, podcasts. So please go to retrievalpractice.org and subscribe for that. Uh, when you subscribe, you also get access to these downloadable guides. Uh, so they're short, they're only 10 pages or so. This one is brand new. Uh, I will be announcing it soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this one, this new one on transfer is all about how retrieval helps students transfer information to new situations, new examples, not just memorization. I've got one on retrieval practice, one on interleaving. Uh, there are more on in the works. I've also mentioned the book, Make It Stick. Uh, my research is featured in the book. And um, there's another book called Small Teaching by James Lang. He's also on Twitter at Lang on Course. It's a book written for higher education, um, but it presents a lot of this research as well. On retrievalpractice.org, you can also find resources from other people doing great things. So here's Matt Miller, who held the Ditch That Textbook Digital Summit. Here's James Lang of Small Teaching. Um, the Learning Scientists do great work and have a lot of wonderful resources. Doug Lamaz from Teach Like a Champion is, uh, has been tweeting recently about retrieval practice. Digital Promise is great. <laughs> so there are lots of great resources for what's next on the website. And slightly different from my question about one strategy you can use, take just a minute, write down, think about one thing you can remember from today. We've only spent about 45 minutes together, but what's one thing you'll remember from today? Exactly, the capital of Australia and <laughs> the date that lawnmowers were invented. See, and I was just going to ask that. So thank you, Tammy. This is a great example of spacing and feedback, right? It can be that simple. I've asked the fact three times in the past 45 minutes, and you will probably remember that date. <laughs> and I will, too. So, um Think about lawnmowers, Australia's. Yeah, just like uh, Peg said, what did you learn yesterday? 
So I do hope we'll focus on getting information out of our students' heads, literally pulling it out. And there's so much research I'm happy to send to anyone. Please follow me on Twitter, send me an email, send me a tweet, and I will um, definitely send along any resources or questions you have. So with that, I will turn it back over for the Q&A. Okay. Let's go back to the top of my list. How do we empower our learners to be more aware of their own memory? So that, I love that question. How can we empower our learners, our students, to be more mm -hmm. aware of their own memory and learning? I think that's where retrieval comes in. It really does. How do we know what we know unless we think about it, remember it, and try to get it out? Another thing I like to do, and I think it's regardless of grade level, is to talk to students about their learning. How mm -hmm. often do we do that, right? Ask our students, how do you study? What helps you remember? How does it feel when you forget? I think asking a lot of those questions puts the onus on students as learners and not just us as teachers. Thanks. How much does the actual process of writing it down make a difference? I think we saw that in some of those graphs. Yes, yeah, it definitely makes a huge difference. Of course, this is just one cherry pick study, um, mm -hmm. but writing everything down, uh, I mean, <laughs> there's actually this research goes back uh, at least more than 100 years, and it really makes a difference from the research we've done in K-12 schools, again, raising students' grades from a C to an A level. How does the importance of the learning matter? If the information is something the student isn't really interested in, how does that impact their learning? Yeah, um, it, it enhances their learning. <laughs> of course, as we know from students, if they're interested in it, and ourselves, if we're interested in it, then we'll remember it much more. Uh, and so, of course, building those connections, helping students see the value in what they're learning makes a difference. What do you think the, uh, it's moved, let's back up this. What do you think the impact is of instant access to information on the Internet? Does that change the urgency of remembering information in the minds of students? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I, I'm not sure about urgency. I'd have to think about that more. Uh, yeah, there are often, well, I can just look things up on Google, so why do I need to remember any uh -huh. of it? And I think that comes back to all kinds of questions about the value of education. But even just, you know, in thinking about the date of a, the invention of a lawnmower, sure, we can look that up on Google. Um, but thinking about how the Civil War started and how that's similar to the Civil Wars going on in the rest of the world, something that's a little harder to Google and understand. And I think having some of those basic understandings, but also retrieving and having discussions like that are something so valuable we can do in classrooms that can't really happen in the same way online. Okay. Your thoughts on retrieval is used in MOOC, quiz and video, and in Minerva University classes. Yeah, um, I saw that in the chat. I'm not familiar with Minerva University, but um, there has been research by my colleagues, Dan Schachter uh, and Carl Spooner uh, on, uh, at Harvard on Khan Academy. And so interspersing quizzes within the videos on Khan Academy uh, is retrieval practice. Again, improves learning. Uh, another interesting component of that research is that including these quick quizzes reduces what we call mind wandering. So literally when our students mind wander, um, lose engagement, that's a benefit of retrieval that gets them back on track because they're thinking. They're not just passively staring at an online video or MOOC or a lecture. This 
this teacher actually teaches college freshmen mainly. Uh, I teach at the college level, and what he sees is that students do not need to use retrieval to succeed in high school, but now it is more vital to succeed on college exams. What's the best way to convince students that using a different strategy like retrieval in college is vital to their success on exams? Mm. Um, one approach uh, I find very valuable at the college level and especially for medical students, for instance, is to emphasize, I, I think this convinces students, is to emphasize that they'll actually save time. So because a lot of study strategies are ineffective, rereading, highlighting, underlining, students will spend time doing that and then they'll forget the information. And so by the time of a cumulative exam or a board exam, they have to restudy again. Because, and then they continue in this cycle of ineffective strategies. As opposed to if students retrieve and quiz themselves, write down what they know while they're reading a book, just close it. Write down some things and then open the book. Um, students can actually save time because they're not forgetting. And so they can actually study less and learn more uh, in the same amount of time or in less time. So I find that a really helpful convincing is, hey, if you do this retrieval, mm -hmm. <laughs> you won't have to study as much down the road. Uh, in regards to retrieval, is there a difference between physically writing things down and typing? Oh, always a good question. So there is one study that has been very popular about typing versus writing notes. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. only one study, but it did get a lot of hype. And so from that study, writing things down is more effective in the context of note taking because mm -hmm. students are typing so fast students can transcribe what professors are saying uh, while they're note taking. In terms of sort of uh, taking notes or at least let's say reading a textbook, closing it and writing down two things you remember, as far as I know, there's no difference between typing and writing in that context. Mm -hmm. A lot more of the research has been done on note taking in classes as opposed to outside of classes. Um, this teacher's learners recently asked the teachers to order questions from tough to easy when they previously ordered them from easy to tough. Any thoughts on that? My suggestion would be, and there's, there's research on this as well, is to um, is to think about the power up I mentioned with interleaving and so to actually mix up item difficulty has a lot of benefits in terms of retrieval, discrimination, um, and keeping students engaged. If students, you know, have a good sense that these are all the hard ones and then it's going to be easy so I can zone out or these are the easy ones and so I can zone out now, mixing up the item difficulty can be um, really effective instead of sort of sequential or in order of difficulty. Those are the questions that I was able to capture. Does anyone else have any questions for Pooja? To what degree should teachers be transparent with students regarding the totality of the content that will be learned by the end of the course or unit in the beginning? She's thinking about Her, the syllabus. Personally, I am completely transparent. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I shouldn't be. Um, so, I mean, I don't sit and, yeah, I don't know. I don't see why I wouldn't be, and, and I guess that I am transparent. And I think for me, the part, again, of empowering the student to understand what's going on uh, and not just leading them along. There's a phrase I heard recently I really like, let's see if I can get it real quick, um, is the uh, sage on stage mm -hmm. versus the guide by the side. And that's how I approach my classes is the guide on the side. I'm a facilitator and so they can have access to any and all of the content anytime my college students would like. Okay. If you give them a study guide to prepare for an exam, does that help or hurt them? 
Mm, good question, Peggy. I think it depends. Maybe you could tell us more about what the study guide would look like. Because there are a lot of different ways, I think. Um, you know, the study guide provided prompts for students. Uh, write down what you know or write down what you think about X, Y, and Z. One thing is if students, for instance, do a brain dump uh, in class, you have them write down everything you know about ancient Egypt, then students at least have notes that they can use outside of class. But those notes are something they retrieve. They're bare notes. They weren't writing them down during class. Um, another thing is that I've done research on open book and closed book quizzes, both in K-12 and college. And of course, as you can guess, when students have access to quizzes or homework that's open book, they don't study as long and they don't remember as much because they're not retrieving. <laughs> so um, I'm actually taking a Spanish class right now and just for fun and um, I get homework and I complete the homework and I, when I take my homework home, I guess, I want to open the book and it's this really funny feeling and I have to tell my, my own self, could you stop cheating yourself, you know? and really complete that homework closed book. And so I think when it comes to study guides, how do you structure them so students are retrieving and they're not just copying out of the book? It can be really important. Any other thoughts on homework? Um, I guess this, this teacher is saying that they don't give homework anymore. Yeah. Um, Rick, could you tell us more type real quick about what you do give or what you do instead. I think I know from Twitter that you give quizzes and retrieval. Um, while he's typing that, I mean, homework, again, can be valuable if it involves retrieval. If homework involves copying something out of a book, not so much. So an out-of-class assignment I give my students is on Flipgrid. Um, I give students a prompt that isn't something they can look up on Google. So, you know, what do you think about um, this New York Times article? And then they have to go on Flipgrid and discuss what they thought. And for me, that's really valuable, quote unquote, homework. Um, but there's no access to an open book sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, those were the questions that I was able to, to capture. We're going to wrap up our show today. Susie, I'm not sure if you're going to be taking over for this slide or if Peggy is. Yes, it's me. Thanks, Susie. Yes, and thank you so much, Pooja. I, I have so many more things to look up. This was great. And I love the way it applies to people you know, K through college. So, and, well, actually adult. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. And people will be able to view this on the uh, the archive that will be posted on our website later and also the wonderful live binder that Peggy made. But thank you so much. And I'll tell you, Pooja was so well prepared for this too. Oh, my. So our upcoming shows, next week we have Jennifer Raygroup, another person from Indiana, our fourth grade April featured teacher. On April 28th, we have Matt Miller of Ditch Book fame. And guess what? He's also from Indiana. Ten things to ditch in education and what to do instead. And on May 5th, we have Sarah Malchow, Global Collaboration Through Online Experiences. So we hope you'll be able to join us again, if not live, but you know the interaction makes our our webinars, I think, wonderful, any time that you can. Thanks, Susie. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harvidon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site. We're taking the the link within the live binder. You can nominate yourself for a featured teacher of the month. The video collection is on iTunes U, so the video recordings are available there. You can subscribe there. You can also subscribe on YouTube for 
previous shows. As you exit the session, the survey link should automatically open in your browser. Uh, you can also take the link from within the chat box or from within the live binder. And at the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out with your name. And you get the certificate thanks to Patty Ruffing's work, as well as having your name printed on the certificate. If you do request one of these, please make sure you use a personal email address to receive it. Otherwise, uh, if you use a school email address, schools tend to block these from getting to you. Our special thanks again to our special guest, Pooja Agarwal, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.